I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll be ending that chapter this morning. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we were in this very passage and we began the first six verses or the first five verses of this passage looking at verses 6 through 10. And we saw in that passage, we saw Paul's praise for this news that he had received about the Thessalonians' faith and their continuing in the gospel. Just to remind you, because it has been a couple of weeks, remember Paul has this godly concern for these brothers and sisters in Christ. He loved them so dearly, and he's concerned about whether or not they are continuing in the faith in the midst of the persecution that they are facing. And so, as you know, they were unable to go visit them as they would have desired, so they send Timothy. Timothy checks on them. Timothy brings back this good news, and the good news is that their faith is strong. Their love is steadfast. And so Paul here in verses 6 through 10 is beaming with praise because of this news. And so now as we turn back to this section this morning, we're going to look, we're going to pick back up in that section in verse 11 and start with Paul's prayer. He moves from praising God for his work to now praying for these Thessalonians and the continued work of God in their lives. And this morning as we look at this prayer, we're going to learn several things that you and I uh, can, can apply to our lives as we consider praying for our love to abound, for our love to increase as we walk in holiness in light of the coming of Christ. I want to ask you to look with me, First Thessalonians. We're actually going to read the whole section again just to get the context, starting in verse 6. We will focus this morning on verses 11 through 13. Verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So again, this morning we turn from Paul's praise now to Paul's prayer. And I I want to just note five things this morning about this prayer and how we can learn from this prayer to inform our own prayers in this regard. The first thing that we see in this passage is that we pray to our triune God. We pray to our triune God. As we think about this prayer that Paul offers, I think it's important for us to remember uh, this fact that we are praying to this triune God that we uh, profess our faith in. Now, this is not the main point of this passage, and so we are not going to spend much time on this. We aren't going to dive in deeply into the doctrine of the Trinity uh, this morning. But I did want to just offer a moment uh, to, to, to draw your attention to the clear affirmation of Jesus' deity in this passage, in the clear affirmation of our triune God that that we pray to. Look at verse 11, how he begins the passage. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Now you wouldn't know this in the English passage, but in the Greek text, verse 11 actually begins with a singular pronoun, that being he. In addition to that, the verb that he uses here when Paul asks for God to, the verb direct our way to you, is a masculine singular verb. What this means is that the verse could be translated, now may he direct our way to you. So uh, Paul is praying here to a singular God. There is one God. But then he defines this singular God here as both, look, our God and Father and our Lord Jesus. You see, Paul understands that this one God exists in multiple persons. He's praying to Jesus in the same way that he is praying to the Father. Paul's prayer shows that he considers Jesus to be of equal authority and of equal God as the Father himself. 
And the divinity of Jesus is actually so potent in this passage that the early church father, Athanasius, actually used this passage to argue his point of the deity of Jesus at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. Again, we won't spend really any more time discussing this this morning other than to draw our attention to this fact that when our, our prayers are offered, when we are praying to our God, we are praying to our triune God. We are praying to our Father through the mediating work of our Lord Jesus in the power and strength of the Spirit. So we see in this passage that we pray to our triune God. Secondly, we pray for the sovereign power of God to intervene in the lives of his children. I want you to notice in these requests here that Paul prays uh, that he attributes sovereign power to God and his ability to answer these requests. Look at the three requests that he makes. He asks for God first to direct our way to you. Uh, Again, this is something that's been completely impossible outside of the apostles' power so far. But he asks God, by your sovereign power, make this happen. He asks in verse 12, may the Lord make you increase in love. Uh, certainly the Thessalonians have, ha- have responsibility in this to pursue love in their own lives, but Paul recognizes that it's outside of our own ability to make sure that happens in our life. Rather, doing so ultimately comes from the power of God working in them for his good pleasure. And then look at verse 13. He asked that God would establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Again, something that only God, our sovereign God, can do and can ensure happens. Now again, this is not the main point of the passage, so we're not going to spend much more time here either. The the next three points kind of cover the main points of our passage, but I think it's important for us to remember that we pray, when we pray, and when we bring these requests to our God that we're going to cover in a moment, we are praying to our triune God and we are praying to our sovereign God. How gracious and kind our God is, isn't he? That he does not simply draw us to himself and justify us and adopt us into his family and then just leave us to fend for ourselves. Rather, as we saw last week, the same God who saves us is the very same God who sanctifies us and is the same God who secures us. So as we consider this morning areas of of growth needed in our lives, when we consider petitions that we're making for openings to ministry, when we consider requests for the salvation of our loved ones, when we consider uh, praying to God to persevere holiness in our lives, when we consider pleading before the throne of God's grace to draw a sinner back to himself, to draw a professing believer to repent of his sin back to himself, when we consider these and a dozen other requests, May we remember, as Paul does in his language this morning, that we are praying to a sovereign God that actually has the power to work in our lives. Let's turn now to the three main points that we see in our passage. The first is that we pray for divine appointed openings for ministry. As I said, Paul offers three specific requests in these verses, one in verse 11, one in verse 12, and one in verse 13. This first one is found here in verse 11. He, he asks God for divine appointed openings for ministry. Look again at verse 11. Notice specifically the end of the verse. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Now remember, this is, this is the, the one thing that Paul has been articulating throughout this letter so far that he longs for to happen. Remember, he has been forcefully led out of the city. He's been forced to abandon these new converts, these new men and women who have professed their faith in Christ. He he longed to return to them. He's itching to see them and see how they are doing, and he's agonizing over the possibility that they may have abandoned the faith. And it's not as though Paul hasn't tried to get back to them, has he? Remember back in chapter 2, verse 18, we saw that Paul tried again and again to make his way back to these believers. But remember, Satan had hindered him. And so he accepts accepts this fact. He sends Timothy, gets his report. We know the story there. But listen, the apostle didn't stop, did he? The apostle Paul did not stop. He, He continued to pray. He continued to implore the Lord to open these doors for ministry that otherwise are shut to 
him. Look at verse 10, the, the verse that we read right before our passage. We pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Verse 11, we pray that God would direct our way to you. Listen, any of us this morning who have served Christ and who have seeked to witness to others and who have sought open doors for ministry understand to some degree the frustration that the Apostle Paul faces here, don't we? Uh, the, the, The frustration and the angst and the concern that Paul must have had. But listen, like Paul, our answers to such roadblocks to ministry must not be discouragement or abandonment must not be muscling through it with our own strength and power. I'm just going to make this happen, even though it seems I can't at all. Rather, like the apostle, our answer must be to call on our sovereign triune God to open doors for ministry for us. We know for Paul that God actually answered this prayer. Later on, if you look at Acts 20, verses 1 through 4, we see that Paul ends up being able to return to Macedonia, and he has an opportunity to actually interact with the key leaders of the Thessalonians from this congregation. But it took quite some time, and he was on his knees before the throne of God, praying to this end for some time. Listen, as you and I consider Paul's example this morning, as we consider uh, this admonition to pray for divine openings, divine appointed openings for ministry, ask yourself this question. What are those openings that you are praying for right now? Perhaps it's it's a family member. Perhaps it's a neighbor. Perhaps it's a friend that you long to see come to Christ. You have, you've witnessed them, you've loved them, you've shared the gospel with them over and over and over, but they aren't interested in any of it. Those doors seem largely to have closed. I encourage you to, to be encouraged and to be exhorted this morning from Paul's example to continue to pray. Continue to seek the Lord. Continue to ask him to work in that situation, to open those doors for ministry in a way that only he can. Uh, Perhaps you have a heart for a certain region, a certain people group, a certain country that the Lord has given, just laid on your heart, and the gospel seems to have no inroads into that group, and you're tempted to be discouraged or to give up. Again, follow the model of the apostle here. Do not be dismayed. Continue to seek the Lord. Continue to pray for divine appointed openings for ministry. Or perhaps as you consider this question, there's nothing that immediately comes to mind. Perhaps you're convicted even in considering the question that there are no divine appointed openings for ministry that you're longing for right now, let alone that you're pleading before God's throne for. If that's you this morning, be encouraged and be challenged by the example of Paul in our passage. Ask the Lord to increase your love for the lost, to see the need of your sharing the gospel, and to ask him to both burden your heart and to direct your way, and to direct your way to these openings for ministry. So as we consider this passage, may we pray for divine appointed openings to ministry. Number four, we pray here for the abounding love of our brothers and sisters. Notice as Paul continues here in verse 12, notice this second request that he makes. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Listen, the the love of these brothers and sisters in Christ was of the utmost concern for the Apostle Paul, wasn't it? Because as we've mentioned before, love is one of those hallmark characteristics of the converted child of God. One author expresses it this way, The most potent expression of our salvation is the love of God working in and through our lives. You see, God adopts us into his family by this miraculous love that he has shown to us through the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf, a a love that we know results in our propitiation and our justification and our adoption and our sanctification and our glorification. And the consistent witness throughout God's word is that all of this, as we understand all of this and as we receive this love shown to us, it will and it must result in an increase and an abounding love. For one another around us. Now, Paul prays here, doesn't he, for two specific spheres 
of our lives, of this love to be shown. Look what he says here. He says, may, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love, number one, for one another, and number two, for all. I think it's important just for a moment for us to, to pause and consider and meditate on this for a moment because I think if we're not careful, we have the tendency to swing the pendulum one way or the other and to neglect one or the other. Perhaps we overemphasize a love for all. We, we rightly want to show love and grace and charity to all men, and, and rightfully so, but in so doing, there, there's nothing unique, there's nothing special, there's nothing remarkable about our love for the church and our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Or perhaps you swing the pendulum the other way, and, and our, our love for one another is such that we show love and care and concern for our brothers and sisters in Christ, rightfully so. But in so doing, we neglect anyone outside of these walls, and we're seen as unloving, uncaring, ungracious toward anyone that doesn't think like us or believe like us. I think both of these would be a wrong combination of what the apostle is praying for here. What, so what exactly does Scripture say about these two different aspects of our love? Let, let me just take a moment to share a few references with you. I put them in your outline for later Reference, But first, we see clear teaching in God's word that there is a general type of love that we are to show for all people. Later in this same letter, in chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. In Galatians 6.10, Paul writes, So then as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Uh, Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2.24, uh, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, enduring evil. And finally, many of you know this, in Matthew 22.39, as, as Jesus is summarizing the law, as he's summarizing God's commandments, and as he s gives the first and the greatest commandment, and then the second after that, the second is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, there is no question, there's no question at all that in God's word we, <clears throat> we are taught and we are commanded to show love in such a way that we show care and concern and grace and charity to all men and women in this world as fellow image bearers of God who need the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must be on guard against this us for and no more mentality, right? Where we kind of get in our holy huddles and, and we only have relationships with people who think like us and act like us and believe like us and behave like us and so forth. We must be on guard against that and we must show love to all people for sure. But with that said, scripture is equally clear that there is a special type of love that we are to show to one another, that, that is to our brothers and sisters in Christ, with whom we are united under the very blood of Christ. We, we saw it just a moment ago in Galatians 6.10. We have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. John 13, 34 and 35, two of my favorite verses in the New Testament. Jesus says that our love for one another will actually be one of the greatest witnesses to the world of our discipleship and of our following after Christ. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Listen to what he sa says in verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. Again, John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another. Galatians, or Romans 16, 10, love one another with brotherly affection. 1 Peter 1, 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another. 1 John 3, 11, this is the message you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Throughout the New Testament, we see that there is this clear, special, unique, remarkable type of love that we are to show as brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is no different than in our own families, is it? We rightly, naturally have a more intense sort of love for our natural, physical family than perhaps we do for our neighbors and for people around us. That's just something we understand that's natural to us. In the same way, uh, the family of God is to show this sort of special, unique love for one another. 
as brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen to how one author summarizes it. He says, the Christian community is that school in which we learn to love. Like great musicians who practice tedious drills for long hours, Christians practice their scales in home in order to sing in public. In the community, love is commanded and modeled, and here is where it must be lived out and practiced. He says, this does not mean that love is limited to the boundaries of the community, but if the community does not live by the model and teaching of its founder, Jesus, how can it expect others to do so or to hear its call to join with them? So as you consider this morning, Paul's prayer for these believers, as you consider uh, this, this call to, to pray for the love of your brothers and sisters in Christ, ask yourself this morning about your own life and your own love. Are you this morning increasing and abounding in love for one another and for all? Are, are you abounding in love for God's people, growing deep in relationships with them, sharing the burdens of life together with them, sharing the, the wages, the, the, the war that you're fighting, that you're waging against sin with them and serving your brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need? Are you increasing in love for all people? sacrificially, humbly, and winsomely serving them with the love of Jesus so that they will see the love of Christ uh, that Christ offers them in the gospel. Listen, ask yourself this. Are there any areas in your life that are currently threatening to diminish your love for one another? Are there any footholds that Satan has in your life that are threatening to actually enter in disunity, which is really just one step closer to us not loving one another. Now, I shared this, this prayer request with our Wednesday night group this past Wednesday, and for those who, who weren't there, I'd like to share it again. As your pastor, one thing that is, that is burdening my heart right now is actually this potential for disunity among us as the body of Christ here at Grace Bible Church because of, because of non-gospel things. You know, I said it countless times as we were in the, the height of our concerns with COVID that Satan would love nothing more, would he, than to actually drive wedges between us as God's people because of how we think differently about the virus, what we think about masks, a whole host of other topics. Satan would love nothing more than to actually use those worldly and non-clear Bible things to actually drive wedges between us and enter in disunity and actually cause us not to love one another. I think we have the potential for it happening again right now around the election and politics and the debates and so forth. I think that Satan, again, would love nothing more than to bring disunity between us as God's people because of our views on political candidates, our views on political parties, even our views on political policies. Listen, we certainly can and we must speak as clearly and with divine authority on those things that God's word speaks directly to. We must never shy away from those things. But if we allow things that are not clearly spoken about in God's word to be things that actually divide us and disunite us, we have allowed Satan a huge victory in our lives. And we have threatened the unity and the love for God's people in the church of Jesus Christ that God would have for us. So it's my, it's my pleading to you, it's my prayer for you as your pastor that you would not allow that to happen, that you would be vigilant to fight against that, and that you would, as Paul prays here in this passage, increase and abound in love for one another and for all. Finally, we see here in our passage, <clears throat> excuse me, that we pray for the holiness of our brothers and sisters as we live in light of the coming of Christ. Verse 13, we see here Paul gives the purpose statement for why he prays for their love in this way. Look at verse 13. We pray that the Lord would increase and abound your love, verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. You see, for Paul here, there is a direct correlation between one's love and one's holiness. I, I don't think it would be biblical for us to say necessarily that love equals holiness, because there's more to holiness than just love. But though love does not equal holiness, certainly love is a key aspect to holiness. 
Or to put it another way, holiness is more than love, but it is certainly not less than love. You see, Paul prays here that the Lord would increase these Christians' love for one another, and the result would be that, they, that God would establish their hearts blameless in holiness before the Father at Christ's coming. Now, when he says here that we are to be blameless, it not, does not mean, as we know, that we can attain this sort of perfection or this perfect state of sinlessness. We know from many other passages in Scripture that that is simply impossible in this life. And that is not the case. Rather, what he's praying for here is that our record of conduct would be such that our record of conduct is that of a godly life. It's the same thing that Peter prays for his readers in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 17. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, quoting Leviticus 11, you shall be holy for I am holy. And so now Paul, as he's looking forward to the coming of Christ, this theme that if you know the book of 1 Thessalonians, this theme that he's about to pick up in a huge way in chapter 4 and chapter 5, he's looking forward to this coming of Christ and he states that only holiness can give us a confident expectation of salvation on that day when Jesus returns. Now we know that that, that blamelessness or a holy life, life does not procure our salvation, does it? But it does prove it. You see, practical evidence of a changed life grants us assurance of faith in the here and now. Uh, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 12, 33, the tree is known by what? Its fruit. In the same way, on that final day of Christ's return, holiness will be the thing that attests to the reality of the faith that we profess that we were saved by. You see, holiness will not save us. Holiness will not justify us. But holiness will vindicate us. It will be that proof. It will be that evidence that our justification is real. As we've often quoted from this pulpit, it will be, as the reformer Martin Luther put it, we are saved by faith alone, right? We believe that wholeheartedly. But the faith that saves is never alone. And so you see, as we consider Paul's prayer for these Thessalonian believers this morning, I believe it gives us an opportune chance to consider the evidence of holiness in our own lives this morning. Ask yourself these questions. Are you actively and intentionally pursuing such holiness in your life right now? Are there areas of weakness in your life or areas where you are finding sin and temptation to have a sway and a hold on you in your life? If so, what are you doing about that? How are you pursuing accountability and help? Listen, God has not ordained that you would pursue holiness in Christ's likeness as some sort of lone ranger. Rather, he has given you the local church to be that body of believers to encourage you and exhort you and to assist you in your fight against sin and in your pursuit of holiness. So what are you doing about that? Are you actively and intentionally praying for the holiness of your brothers and sisters in Christ in this body as Paul is praying for these brothers and sisters? Have you, even, have you pursued and are you continuing to pursue relationships with one another in this body to such a degree that you move past the surface issues of life and you actually know the strengths and the weaknesses of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Have you entered into one another's life to such a degree that you specifically know how to pray for their holiness because you know where their holiness is being threatened right now? To do so, I believe, brothers and sisters, is part and parcel of what it means for us to love one another. Remember Paul's prayer here, that we would abound in love for one another so that God would establish our hearts blameless before the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus. I want to conclude our time together this morning in God's word before we observe the elements of the Lord's table in communion. I want to tell you a, a brief story that I read this week that I think illustrates and, illustrates and highlights well what we've been discussing this morning. In 1994, a celebration was held at Westminster Abbey in London to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the Westminster Confession of Faith. At that celebration, one of the speakers was a man named Eric Alexander, who spoke about Paul and these early Christians and the, and the, the persecutions and difficulties that they, 
face. He pointed out in his speech that their knowledge of what God was doing in history and for their own salvation, quote, injected a certainty into their tentative, weak, poor faith. It gave many of them a security in a desperately insecure world. Were we more heavenly minded in our living, it would do the same for us, he says. Alexander goes on in this speech and he asks a series of pointed questions to help us think about our lives. These are the questions that he asked that group. What is the really important thing that is happening in the world in our generation right now? Where are the really significant events taking place? What is the most important thing? Where do you need to look in the modern world to see the most significant event from a divine perspective? Where is the focus of God's activity in history? How would you answer those questions this morning? What would you identify as the great marvel of our time here in the 21st century? The thing that demands our attention today? Well, listen to the answer that Alexander gave. He said, the most significant thing happening in history is the calling, redeeming, and perfecting of the people of God. God is building the church of Jesus Christ, he says. The rest of history is simply a stage that God erects for that purpose. He is calling out a people. He is perfecting them. He is changing them. History's great climax comes, he says, when God brings down the curtain on this bankrupt world and the Lord Jesus Christ arrives in infinite glory. The rest of history is simply the scaffolding for this real work. Alexander finishes his speech there by remembering the last time that he had been in London. At that time, Westminster Abbey was actually covered in scaffolding as workers were were seeking to clean and beautify it. He says that one could not see its true beauty, but one was aware that something significant was happening behind that scaffolding. And drawing on that image, he applies that to our lives and the church in much the same way that the Apostle Paul does here as he prays for God to cause our awareness of our future in Christ to spur us on to holiness. Listen to how he closes. He says, there will come a day when God will pull down the scaffolding of world history. Do you know what he will be pointing to when he says to the world, there is my masterpiece? He will be pointing to the church of Jesus Christ. In the forefront of it all will be the Lord Jesus himself who will come and say, Here I am and the children you have given me, perfected in the beauty of holiness. Brothers and sisters, this is the day for which we are laboring. This is the day when we look forward to that day when we will be resurrected and perfected in holiness. Our task now is to live for that day. And if we live for that day, it will change our living, won't it? It will change our serving now. It will change even our praying now. May we, like the Apostle Paul here, pray for divine appointed openings for ministry. May we pray for the abounding love of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and may we pray for the holiness of one another as we live in light of that day and in light of the coming of Christ. And with the Apostle John, we will say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray together.